Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to invite you to a virtual CHIPAC um, Discover Our Universe series. So my name is Risa Wexler and I'm the director of CHIPAC, which is the Kabli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford and SLAC. And um, we are doing a wonderful um, bi-weekly public lecture series. I am really pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Wilkins. Dan is a research scientist at, uh, at KIPAC. He uh, did his PhD in Cambridge and he was an Einstein fellow, uh, at, at, came, to, came to Stanford as an Einstein fellow uh, where he has been doing really interesting work um, at the interface of understanding black holes and, um, and using x-rays to understand them. So um, I want to remind you first that if you uh, did not uh, catch our first two lectures on exoplanets and, and dark matter, that you can do so at any time on YouTube, and you can watch this one on YouTube as well. I want to secondly remind you that while we're going, we really welcome your questions. Um, so you can, if you're on Zoom, you can write those into the chat. And if you are, um, if you're on YouTube, you can also write them there and we'll take your questions at the end. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, let Dan get started. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Risa, and good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you in these interesting circumstances, um, but to maybe take a little bit of a break from the world this evening and to talk about some of the most extreme systems that we see in our universe. These are, of course, supermassive black holes. As we gaze into the night sky here on Earth, the universe might look like a calm and peaceful place, but looks can be deceiving. There are some pretty violent and energetic processes going on out there that dwarf even the power of our own sun. Take Messier 106, a galaxy 25 million light years away, a beautiful spiral of more than 100 billion stars. This spectacular image from the Hubble Space Telescope reveals that there's a monster lurking at the center of this galaxy. There is something at the heart of this galaxy shining as bright as 100 billion stars. Whatever is in the heart of this galaxy is shining as bright as all of the stars in that galaxy put together. That's a whole galaxy's worth of power compressed into a region of space the size of our solar system. These are known as active galactic nuclei. They fall into a number of different categories. They've got a number of different names. One of these names you might have heard are quasars. These are the most luminous, continuous sources of light that we see in our entire universe. That's not counting supernovas and other explosive events that don't last long, but talking about the brightest continuous sources of light. And today I'm going to talk about exactly what powers such extreme systems, how we can study them and discover how they can put on some fantastic firework displays for us. Well, the first question we'll want to ask is how can we power something so bright? To tackle this question, we're going to ask how bright is bright? And to do that, we're going to turn to Albert Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. In this equation, Einstein said that we can consider energy and matter to be equivalent. We can think of mass or matter as being condensed, stored up energy. And to work out how much energy there is compressed into something with mass m, we multiply it by the speed of light squared. Now the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. It's a big number. So that tells us how much energy there is condensed into solid material. Now, if we could ever tap into 100% of the matter that we throw in as fuel into this monster, we would need to consume 10,000 times the mass of the planet Earth every day to keep this bright light shining. But of course, in real life, we can't be 100% efficient. How efficient can we be in getting the energy out of fuel? 
What percentage of the MC squared energy that's stored up in the fuel can we get out? Well, the first thing we might want to try to do with fuel is a chemical reaction. We might want to try and burn it or explode it like TNT. Well, chemistry can only tap into one hundred thousandth of one percent of the energy that's stored up in the mass of fuel. Which makes sense when we burn something, most of the mass is left behind. We get a lot of gas coming off the fire and we get the ash that's left behind. Very little comes out as light and heat. Nuclear fission, such as in a nuclear reactor, does a little bit better. It can get one hundredth of one percent of the energy out. And the nuclear fusion that powers sunlight can get out one tenth of one percent. But there's only one force that we know of that's going to be able to release anywhere near as much energy to keep this monster shining. And that is from the force of gravity. Gravity is the mutual attraction between everything in our universe. Every bit of mass is attracted to every other bit of mass. And how strong the force of gravity is depends how much mass there is and how close you can get to its center. Usually gravity is an extremely weak force. We don't feel ourselves being attracted to everything with mass around us. The only gravity that we notice on a daily basis is that from the Earth. The Earth is the only massive object that's near enough to us. We also experience the gravity of the sun. This is what keeps the Earth traveling in orbit around the solar system. Now, energy gets released when things fall under gravity. We know this from our everyday lives. If we drop something, it speeds up as it falls towards the Earth. It gains kinetic energy. And eventually, when it hits the ground, that energy is released as sound and heat. But if we can make the force of gravity stronger, that is, if we can make something more massive and we can make it dense so it's small enough that we can get close to its center, it turns out that we can release up to 40% of the energy that's stored up in the matter that's falling in. But how can we get something that's heavy enough, that's small enough, that's dense enough to provide a force of gravity that is strong enough to power that monster in Messier 106? Well, to find out what can be so dense, we're gonna to turn to a massive star coming to the end of its life. Throughout a star's life, it's a perfect balance of two forces. There's that gravity again, the mutual attraction between every bit of gas in that star. Every bit of gas in the star is being attracted towards every other bit of gas. Gravity is trying to crush that star down by pulling it together. But as the gravity pulls the star together, the gas heats up and the thermal pressure of that gas pushes out. And it's the balance of these two forces that keeps a star up. But as a star comes to the end of its life, it runs out of the fuel it needs for those nuclear fusion reactions that power the starlight and power that thermal pressure that fights the gravity. So if we lose that outward force, gravity starts to win and the star collapses. If the star is massive enough, the gravity pulling it together is strong enough that it collapses extremely quickly. The gas gets compressed and it gets heated up again. And this causes the massive star to explode as a spectacular supernova explosion. The outer layer of the star expands in this beautiful supernova, but what's left behind keeps collapsing as the force of gravity pulls it together. Now, if there's enough material left behind, there's no force that's going to be able to overcome that strong gravity, and it's going to keep getting smaller, and it's going to keep getting denser. Now that we're concentrating the mass that's left from that star into a very small space, the gravity at the surface is going to become very strong. Back in 1783, the British mathematician John Mitchell and working independently, the French mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace were thinking about what happens when you make something so dense that its gravity becomes this strong. They were thinking about the gravity that keeps us here on the surface of Earth. If you throw up a ball, eventually it'll turn around and it'll come back down. 
if you throw it up faster, the ball will go a little bit higher before it comes back. If you throw that ball fast enough, it can escape the Earth's gravity altogether. This is what we call the escape velocity, and it's exactly the principle we use to launch a rocket into orbit. But the more massive the planet is, the more massive whatever the object is that's providing the gravity, the higher velocity you need to reach in order to escape its gravity. Now, back in 1783, they knew that even though light travels fast, it doesn't travel instantly. Light still takes time to get between two places. So what if you had something so massive that its gravity is so strong that the speed you need to get to to escape is faster than the speed of light? Now that means that not even light is going to be able to escape our star. And John Mitchell coined this term dark stars in his early work. And it's this concept of dark stars that would eventually morph into what we call today black holes. We can just think of a black hole as an object that has collapsed under gravity so much and its density is so high that the force of gravity just outside it is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. But a complete theory that described how a black hole could be formed and how a black hole would behave had to wait until 1916, when Albert Einstein published his theory of general relativity. Now for the mathematically minded among you, Einstein's entire theory is summed up in this equation. So if you understand what this equation is, you don't need to hear the rest of my talk. Everything I'm going to say is right there. But if you're like me, and you like to see things explained in a few more pictures, stay tuned. What did Albert Einstein mean in his theory of general relativity? Well, Einstein's theory was summed up by John Archibald Wheeler with the words, matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. Let's see what Wheeler means. The first thing we're going to do to think about this is we're going to take our three dimensional universe and we're gonna take away a dimension. So instead of thinking in our three dimensional universe, we're going to think about a two dimensional sheet of paper. We're going to think about living on a sheet and you can only move forwards and backwards, left and right. You cannot move up and down off this sheet. But we're going to invoke Isaac Newton's laws of motion. Isaac Newton said that if you throw a ball, if you just release a ball, so long as you don't apply any force to that ball, it will just keep traveling in a straight line until it stops, until you apply a force to it. But in Einstein's theory, we start with space as being this flat sheet, but now if we put an object into space, like a planet, that planet makes a dent. Now we're going to throw the ball again. The ball is going to try and follow a straight line, but it can't leave the sheet. It can't jump up and down. This means the ball has to travel down and around the dent. So it appears that there's a force pulling the ball towards the planet. And that is the force of gravity. It is a dent made in our three-dimensional space by the presence of matter. And the concept of a black hole is created quite naturally in Einstein's theory. If we create an object that's very compact, very heavy, very dense, it's going to make an infinitely deep well in space and time. If you're a long way away from that object, this dent just looks like a normal dent in space, like that made by a planet or a star. So you just feel a normal force of gravity if you're a long way away from the black hole. But there's a point where the dent becomes extremely steep. It looks like a well. This is the point of no return, and it's called the event horizon. If you cross this point, there's no way out, and you're doomed to falling in. But with Einstein's theory of gravity, we're no longer thinking of it as an attraction between different bits of matter. Now we're thinking of gravity as being a curve in space itself, 
even light has to follow the curves. Light travels very fast, so the bending of light is very subtle. But if you have a big enough dent in space, such as that made by a really heavy galaxy or by a black hole, the light has to travel through the dents as well. The light has to be bent. And we can kind of think about the black hole as acting like a lens. But in order to make something with such a deep dent in space, if you started off with the Earth, you'd have to crush it down to a radius of just one centimeter. So that really is something very dense, very compact. Something the mass of the sun, on the other hand, you'd have to crush it down to being about a mile across. Now, where can we find these black holes? Well, we're looking for the highest energy processes in the universe. So we're going to look for the highest energy forms of light coming to us. In this case, we're going to look for X-rays coming from space. When we look at the sky in X-rays, we see that this high energy form of light comes from individual points, a little bit like stars, but not shining with visible light, shining with high energy X-ray light. Now these X-ray lights aren't just confined to our galaxy, which is the band across the middle of this image, but we see these X-ray points of light scattered all around the sky. They're scattered all through the universe. Now this is actually the latest image of the X-ray sky released by the German E. Rosita mission just this month. One of the first X-ray lights was discovered in 1964 by early X-ray detectors that were launched on short rocket flights. It's in the constellation of Cygnus, and rather unimaginatively, it's named Cygnus X1, the first X-ray source in Cygnus. Now, when astronomers first saw this X-ray light, they were keen to work out exactly what it was. Louise Webster and Paul Murdin at the Royal Greenwich Observatory in the UK and Charles Bolton at the University of Toronto's Dunlap Observatory studied this mysterious X-ray source with telescopes. And the first thing they saw was a big star somewhere between 15 and 30 times the size of our sun. But this was a little bit puzzling because we know from looking at our sun that stars don't really emit X-rays. So how could Cygnus X1 be producing X-rays? Well, closer investigation of this massive star showed that it was moving. This star appeared to be traveling around in orbit around something else. It's in a binary system traveling around some companion. We can work out how heavy the companion has to be based on the force of gravity we need to stop this star just flying off into space. And it turns out this mysterious companion has to be about 15 times the mass of the sun. So maybe this mysterious object is ripping the star apart and it's the force of gravity pulling in the stellar material, releasing this energy. But to release this much energy to power these bright X-rays, we need something compact and dense. Could this have been the first observation of a black hole? Well, at the time, many scientists were skeptical. Even Albert Einstein himself, his theory came up with black holes, but he thought they were too weird to ever exist. So too did Stephen Hawking, famous black hole scientist, devoted a lot of his career to working on black holes, thought that black holes were too weird to exist. But by 1973, the evidence on Cygnus X1 was mounting. It was discovered that the brightness of Cygnus X1 flickers in times as short as one millisecond. This means that this 15 solar mass object has to be at most 100 kilometers across. And it was behaving in exactly the way that was predicted for a black hole. So in 1973, the astronomical community started to come to the conclusion that Cygnus X1 really was the first observation of a real black hole in our universe. Black holes were moving from science fiction and science theory to real science fact. But this black hole has gravity so strong that not even light can escape it. 
So how is it we can see them powering these bright X-ray lights like in Cygnus X1? Well, it turns out that most stars in our universe don't live out their lives alone. They have companions in binary systems. These are pairs of stars in orbit around each other. If one of these stars comes to the end of its life before the other, it can explode in a supernova, and then what's left can collapse into a black hole. And this can form a system like Cygnus X1. If that companion star gets too close, the force of gravity from the black hole starts tugging on the surface and pulling the gas from the star into it. As the gas gets closer to the black hole, it gets crushed together and it gets heated up to one million degrees. We see this extremely hot gas glowing. Now we're used to heating things up and seeing them glow red, maybe yellow and maybe blue. But as things get to a million degrees, they start not just glowing in visible colors of light we can see, but they start glowing in ultraviolet light and even these X-rays that we've been seeing from Cygnus X1. This material can also get so hot, so energetic, that these spectacular jets launch out from just outside the black hole, traveling at almost the speed of light. And we'll come back to these a little bit later on. Now these small black holes form at the ends of the lives of many massive stars, and we find them scattered all throughout our galaxy. They weigh something like 10 times as much as our sun, and they're about a mile across each. But in each galaxy, we also find a supermassive black hole, a black hole that weighs somewhere between 1 million and 1 billion times the mass of our sun. And these black holes will be somewhere between a million and a billion miles across. The supermassive black holes are found at the centers of galaxies. And we think that every big galaxy in our universe hosts a supermassive black hole. They're buried amongst the stars, in this case, in the center of the spiral in the Andromeda galaxy. And of course, all the best galaxies have one. This is the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of stars and there's a lot of dust and gas that we can see in this image. But we're going to zoom in on the bright point right at the center. It's called Sagittarius A star. Now this is a movie made from 16 years of observations with the Keck telescope on Hawaii measuring how the stars in that very center part of our galaxy are moving. We can see that these stars are traveling in orbit around something, but we can't see what that something is. But we can look at how fast these stars are traveling. That means we can work out how strong the gravity needs to be to stop these stars just flying off and to keep them in their orbits. If we know how strong the gravity needs to be, we know how heavy the object needs to be. We also know that this mysterious object has to be small enough to fit inside the smallest of those orbits because that star's just happily traveling around in orbit, it isn't crashing into anything. So this heavy object in the center can't be very big. It turns out that this object needs to weigh two million times as much as our sun, and Einstein's theory tells us that something this heavy and this small must be a supermassive black hole. Sagittarius A star is our own galaxy's supermassive black hole. Now, luckily for us, most of the time, Sagittarius A star is pretty quiet. It isn't fueling this giant monster like Messier 106. But if we look closely at the X-rays coming from Sagittarius A star, we see that it does flare up occasionally. We see these little flickers of X-rays coming out of the black hole or out from the region near our black hole in the center of our galaxy. Remember that no light can come out of the black hole itself. But what we think is happening is that little bits of dust, little bits of gas, maybe little micrometeorites are wandering too close to that black hole 
they're getting shredded apart, they're getting superheated, they're producing a little flash of x-rays in the moments just before they fall in through the event horizon. What about that monster we saw in Messier 106? Well, when there's enough gas close to a black hole in the center of a galaxy, it can continuously feed the black hole. Not just little micrometeorites occasionally wandering too close, but a continuous supply of gas being funneled into that black hole. If you're able to swallow about 10,000 times the mass of the Earth a year, then you can power a light as bright as this monster that we can see from millions of light years away across the universe. So how do we study these black holes in detail? Well, we've moved on a bit from launching X-ray detectors onto rockets. Today, we have a fleet of X-ray observatories. These are satellites in full-time orbit around the Earth, such as Chandra, launched by NASA in 1999. This telescope is about the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's XMM Newton, a similar sized telescope launched by the European Space Agency also in 1999. These are telescopes that take images of the sky, just not in the visible light that our eyes can see, but in the high energy X-ray light that is coming from the hottest gas and from the most energetic processes in our universe, some of which are happening right around black holes. We can measure the precise energy of the X-rays that these telescopes receive. We can think about the energy of X-rays as being like the color of light. Lower energy X-rays are a bit like red light, higher energy X-rays are a bit like blue light. Now, moving on from 1999, in 2012, NASA launched a small explorer mission called NuSTAR. This was an X-ray observatory that extended our range to even higher energy X-rays than we were able to see before. And of course, we're always planning ahead. And at Stanford, we're currently involved in designing some of the new X-ray detector technology that's going to launch on the European Space Agency's next X-ray telescope, Athena. We're currently finalizing the design and the new technology that will make this possible. And we plan to launch this new observatory in about 2032. A large part of my own research is using the observations of black holes that are made by these giant X-ray observatories to try and find out exactly what's happening around black holes and piece together the processes that are powering some of the brightest objects that we see in the universe. Unfortunately, most of these black holes are so small and far away that we see them just as single points of light on the sky. But by making precise measurements, of the energies or colors of the X-rays that are emitted, and looking at how they vary in time, we're able to build up a 3D picture of this extreme environment by a black hole. There's an impressive storm brewing. We see a hot disk of glowing gas spiraling slowly into the black hole. This gas gets whipped off by turbulence. A strong wind blows off the disk. And the gas spiraling into the black hole gets so hot as it's crushed towards the black hole that the electrons get free from the atoms. The electrons swirl around the black hole and in doing so they generate enormous electric currents. This turns the gas around the black hole into a huge electromagnet and this makes something that we call the corona. The corona of electrons that get accelerated to extremely high energy. And this is that intense source of X-rays that were first discovered coming from Cygnus X1. It turns out that this corona is very useful to our studies because it actually shines down on the disk of gas. We can measure the X-rays that reflect off of the gas in its final moments before they fall into the black hole. And by measuring these reflections, we're able to build up this picture. The black holes we study sometimes let off bright X-ray flares. They suddenly get around 10 times brighter for just a few days. And we were able to discover that during these flares, this corona gets gathered up and shot away from the black hole, 
almost like this black hole was trying to launch a jet, but it didn't quite manage it. And it's by measuring how X-rays reflect off this disk of gas falling into the black hole that we're able to reconstruct an image of what the disk would look like, even though it's so small and far away, we only see it as being a single point of light. Now this, in reality, is a flat disk of material that spirals around the black hole, but the light rays that reflect off of it have to travel to us through the extremely curved space around the black hole. This means that the light rays coming from this disk gets bent, the image is distorted, and the black hole acts like a giant lens. And a big part of my research has been measuring how the stretching of space around a black hole shifts the energies or colors of the X-rays that we detect and how it leads to time delays between the X-ray reflections we see coming from different parts of the disk and using precisely those measurements to reconstruct this image of what a black hole would look like if we could ever resolve it with a powerful enough telescope. In particular, notice the distortion in the image. The part above the black hole, this is actually an image of the back of the disk, but the light coming from the back of the disk is actually getting bent around the black hole. So the back of the disk appears above. As you get closer to the black hole on the left-hand side, the X-rays get stretched to lower energies. The light coming from that side becomes more red as they travel away from the black hole. On the right-hand side, however, there's a bright spot. The material on this side of the disk is coming towards us at half the speed of light, and this is shifting the X-rays up to higher energies and pushing them forwards, pushing that X-ray emission straight into our line of sight. So we've reconstructed these incredible pictures of black holes from the measurements we've made of the X-rays that reflect off of the gas falling in. But we had not managed to take a direct photograph or image of the black hole until last year, that was. Now, seeing things the size of the event horizon, even in the nearest supermassive black holes, is the equivalent of seeing something as small as an apple on the surface of the moon. The smallest object that you can see with a telescope depends on how big the telescope is. The bigger the telescope, the higher its resolution and the smaller details you can see with it. But to see the event horizon and the gas swirling into even our nearest supermassive black hole, you need a telescope that is the size of the planet Earth. Well, it's not really feasible to turn the whole Earth into a telescope, but fortunately, there's a trick. We can combine the light that's seen by more than one telescope. And if we do this, the resolution of this virtual telescope doesn't depend on the size of one telescope, but it depends on the distance between the telescopes. So if we can space telescopes around the world, we can simulate having a telescope that's as big as the planet Earth. Now this tends to be done with radio telescopes. Radio telescopes can see the energetic material falling into the black hole because those electrons that are swirling around the black hole, as they move around, they behave just like a radio transmitter. And these multiple telescopes around the world were connected together into what was called the Event Horizon Telescope. They looked at the same part of the sky and the signals recorded onto many computer disks, and they were put on planes and flown to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn in Germany, where the signals were combined. And here's the result. This is not a simulation. This is a real image seen in the radio waves being emitted from the hot gas around the black hole in the center. Now the image is circular, showing that we're looking almost top down on that disk of gas. Just like the theory, just like that reconstructed image, the gas is going round in orbit, 
and the side that comes towards us at the bottom of the image is brighter, and the side that's moving away from us is a little bit dimmer. But the dark patch in the middle is the shadow of the black hole. So what are these black holes capable of? Well, this rather unremarkable galaxy, Cygnus A, hosts one of the most spectacular supermassive black holes we've discovered. This is just the visible light image, an image from the light that our eyes can see. But if instead of looking at the visible light, we look at the X-ray image, we see that this galaxy is bathed in hot one million degree gas. But where is this gas coming from and how is it getting heated to a million degrees? Well, let's look again at the radio waves. If we look at the radio waves coming from around this galaxy, we can see these spectacular jets that extend far beyond the confines of that small galaxy in the center of the image. These jets are traveling at almost the speed of light and they're slamming into the surrounding gas, heating it up and producing these giant inflated loaves. These jets are being launched by a tiny black hole in the center of that galaxy. This is a black hole about a billion times the mass of our sun, but it's tiny compared to the whole galaxy, let alone these jets and lobes that are extending far beyond the reaches of the galaxy. Now, if we add up all of the energy that's being released by this black hole, all of the energy that's coming out in the light, all of the energy that's coming out in those jets, all of the energy that's blowing in winds from that gas falling in. It turns out that the total energy output of a black hole in the center of a galaxy is more than the gravitational energy that holds the stars in a galaxy. That means if we could somehow take all of the energy that's coming out from around that supermassive black hole, and we could share that energy into all the stars in the galaxy, we could blow the galaxy apart. But that doesn't happen. We live in a galaxy. Our universe is full of galaxies that haven't been blown apart by the black holes in the center. So what is happening here? Let's think about how those galaxies are growing. Galaxies are growing as gas falls into them from the surroundings. And we can imagine that as a galaxy grows bigger, the black hole in its center grows bigger. As that black hole is growing bigger, its output, its radiation, and its jets are getting stronger. And eventually that will start to gradually push out that gas that's trying to fall into the galaxy. And this will limit how big that galaxy is able to grow. We can see this process in action in the Perseus cluster. This is one of the largest systems in our universe. These are thousands of galaxies. Each of these bright points of light is a whole galaxy. These galaxies are all held together by the force of gravity. And we're going to zoom in particularly on this bright galaxy. This bright galaxy at the heart of the Perseus cluster has a lot of gas being directed towards it. The force of gravity from all of those galaxies in the cluster is pulling in a lot of gas and it's getting funneled down into this galaxy, which lets this galaxy grow and grow. And we can see from this Hubble Space Telescope image that there's something happening in these galaxies. These long filaments 
these bright filaments are reaching out into the surroundings. Well, let's again not look in the visible light, but we're going to look for these energetic processes from the high energy X-ray light that we can see. On top of this Hubble Space Telescope visible light image, I'm going to overlay the X-ray image from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We can see that just like Cygnus A, this galaxy is bathed in hot gas. But not only that, there are these lobes in the gas. What's happening in the heart of the Perseus cluster is we have gas falling in to the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy. This supermassive black hole is launching jets. These jets are extending out of the galaxy and they're heating up the gas trying to fall in. It's blowing these bubbles, it's blowing these lobes. Black holes are not just astronomical ornaments. They played a vital role in shaping the structure of the universe as we see it today. If we want to understand how everything formed and evolved into the universe that we see, we need to understand what happens to matter in its final moments before it plunges into a black hole. How these impressive jets, flares, and fireworks are launched. So, think of this supermassive black hole in the heart of this galaxy, not as a great destructive monster, destroying everything that falls into it. Think of it as a sculptor, gently guiding the formation of this galaxy, stopping this galaxy from growing too big. And just to put a size scale on this, the black hole controlling the growth of this galaxy is the equivalent to something the size of a grape controlling the planet Earth. Well, thank you everyone, I'll stop there. All right, uh, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, that was a fantastic tour of uh, sort of everything uh, from, from black holes to galaxies and, and um, so much about gravity and, and Let's, uh, we already have a great set of questions. Um, so the first question, kind of going back to uh, the beginning of what you had to say about um, what Einstein said about gravity. And the question is, um, since energy is equivalent to matter, can, can energy cause space time to curve as well? And especially in really dense regions like around AGN. Um, yes, absolutely. So um, Einstein said that actually gravity is caused by a curve in space that's made by absolutely everything that happens to be in that space. So it's not just the solid matter, but if we have um, strong electromagnetic fields swirling around the black hole, that'll increase the force of gravity. Um, and if we have um, other forms of energy, other um, other accumulations of light in our universe, that'll all cause space to curve and it'll, it'll all cause gravity. Fantastic. So we have two questions uh, about how black holes grow. So mm. the first question is, can a stellar mass black hole actually become a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy? And the, a, a related question is, which comes first, the galaxy or the supermassive black hole at the center. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll, I'll take that as, um, as two different uh, questions, two separate questions. So the first one um, on the growth of those, um, those stellar mass black holes. Um, we actually think that a, a stellar mass on black hole on its own probably isn't going to be able to grow into something supermassive, um, just because there's not enough gas really around those stars to fall in. Um, and also if the, the black hole tries to grow too quickly by swallowing too much gas too quickly, it'll release too much energy. And in releasing all that energy, all it's going to do is push its own food supply away. So if a black hole ever grows too quickly, it'll actually stop itself from growing just by cutting right. off and it's gonna fall into it. Yeah. Um, 
Now that actually leads to, to your second question, that actually we understand how stellar mass black holes form. We don't fully understand how supermassive black holes form. Um, one thing that's been a really surprising discovery over the last few years is if we look at some of the most distant quasars, some of these, these really bright supermassive black holes in really far reaches of our universe. Um, now, I should say before I get into this that the further away we're looking, the longer the light is going to take to get to us. So if we look at something a long way away, we're looking at it not as it is today, but as it was millions or billions of years ago. So we can look back to our early universe just by looking at things a long way away. Um, now, when we look at these quasars a really long way away, it turns out that they already have really, really big black holes in them, which surprised us. Um, we thought that the black holes should grow steadily as the galaxy grows. Um, so you should see small black holes early on and you should see big black holes um, only in the more recent uh, nearby parts of the universe. Um, so we, we've kind of struggled to understand exactly how quickly black holes can, can grow. Um, we know that dark matter plays an important role that um, actually Risa talked about last week. We need enough dark matter in our universe to provide enough gravity early on that lets things collapse to the galaxies that we see. Um, so one idea for black hole formation is that actually you get a lot of gas that gets pulled in by the gravity from the dark matter that just directly forms a really big black hole. And then the black hole sort of forms very early on and the galaxy sort of grows around it. But the other idea is actually the, the, the black hole comes a little bit later. The galaxy comes first, you get a lot of stars in the galaxy. And this is where I'm gonna go back to the first question because even though a stellar mass black hole on its own probably can't become a supermassive black hole, one thing we think can happen is if we have lots of, um, lots of stars in a very early part of the galaxy that all become black holes, all those black holes can then fall into each other and merge into a big black hole when you've got millions of stars doing it. Um, but it's actually going to be a really exciting um, space to watch over the next few years as we get um, new surveys coming online to find more of these. I think we're going to learn a lot more about where these supermassive black holes come from. Yeah, that's great. And I'll just, just echo that as somebody who thinks about this more from the galaxy side, that uh, there's a real interplay between people who think about galaxies trying to understand the influence of black holes on galaxies and people who think about black holes trying to understand how they form within galaxies and, and impact them. So it's a really, um, really nice interplay between those subfields that's got a lot going on and uh, that we expect to happen with the next generation of, of um, observations. Um, let me just then follow up on a related question about those observations. Um, someone asked a great question, which I'm sure you have a lot to say about how much do the X-ray observatories cost and how long do they take um, sort of from, from start to finish? <laughs> so, so that's actually a question that's very close to my heart because I'm actually part of the team that's uh, working on this Athena X-ray Observatory. Um, so the, the first idea for Athena actually came along in 1999. And um, as soon as XMM Newton and Chandra got launched, we were thinking about, okay, we've built this great telescope, but what are we gonna do next? because it takes so long to actually get all the development in place. Um, it was in 2014 that the European Space Agency finally agreed with us that this is a really great thing to build. So we got the green light for the project in 2014. Um, and from 2014 until today and beyond, we've been developing all of the new technologies that are going to make Athena better than XMM Newton and Chandra. Um, so, um, and then, so that's a 2014 green light from the European Space Agency. Um, and then you've got about 15 years after that, it takes to actually launch the mission because um, we have to develop a lot of new technology to do this. So um, it's something truly groundbreaking. We're not just doing the same thing again. Um, we also have to build the spacecraft. We have to test the spacecraft and we actually put these spacecrafts through extreme conditions um, they get shaken, they get heated um, to make sure that they're going to survive the launch, they're going to survive in orbit. Um, and then that takes you all the way up to the launch date. Um, so it's about, 
about 15 years we're looking at. Um, and the price tag on that, um, it's a little bit different depending on whether you're building things in, in Europe or in the United States, just because the way the space agency is set up is different. Uh, but the price tag on Athena is somewhere, it's about 3 billion euros, which in the US would be somewhere about $5 billion. Thank you. Um, you talked about the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, has it looked at any other objects? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so the Event Horizon Telescope can, um, can actually see the Event Horizon in two supermassive black holes. The first one is the beautiful image that um, I'm sure many of us have seen. Um, it got a lot of coverage in the media um, as well as through um, sort of scientific channels. And that is the, the supermassive black hole in M87. Um, now we can see M87 because it's a, a fairly nearby black hole, um, but it's also a really big black hole, which means that the event horizon is a billion miles across. So it being not too far away and big makes it I'm not going to say easy to see, but it means <laughs> it's possible to see it. Um, the other one the Event Horizon Telescope can see is the one in our own galaxy. Um, that one is about a thousand times smaller than M87, but fortunately it's a thousand times nearer. So it actually works out about the same size on the image. Um, we haven't yet seen the image of, MA of um, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, it's unfortunately a little bit more complicated to do the analysis on that just because it's smaller and it, um, it flickers more quickly. So it's harder to get the image out. Um, but we're very much looking forward to seeing that second black hole. Um, I'm gonna say fingers crossed over the next 12 months. Yeah, I hope so. Um, there's another great question about X-ray telescopes. Are any of the X-ray telescopes serviceable like Hubble or can you upgrade them in any way to take advantage of new technology? Unfortunately not. Um, Hubble is the only space observatory um, we've ever built that could have been serviced uh, because it was in a low orbit very close to Earth and we had the space shuttle. It was the combination of those two things that meant we could get back to Hubble and we could pull it into the shuttle's cargo bay to work on it. Unfortunately, Chandra, XMM, they're too far away even if we had the shuttle and we don't have the shuttle anymore. And the new ones we're putting even further away. So unfortunately, we, we really have to get this technology right the first time. We don't get a second chance. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we heard about planets outside our solar system. And there's a question about how black hole, how the black hole in our galaxy can affect our solar system or maybe other solar systems? Are there any, are there any interactions between that black hole? and um, solar systems or planets? That's a good question, actually. Um, so sort of in our day-to-day -day experience, sort of at the moment, um, the black hole doesn't really seem to have a big effect on us. Um, we don't really feel much radiation or much energy coming from the black hole. All we see is a little bit of light coming from it every now and then. Um, and we're far enough away from it in the center of our galaxy that we don't really feel its gravity. It's, we're traveling around in orbit around it, but it's not really pulling on us at all. Um, but actually that turns out to be a good thing for us because if we lived in a galaxy like Messier 106 with this giant monster at its center, um, chances are we'd, well, we'd at least get a very good suntan, if not be completely <laughs> cooked. Um, but we actually, think that um, that at some point in its history, our black hole was doing that. We think that every black hole went through this active feeding phase and that's how it governed the growth of its galaxy. But then over time, it runs out of fuel and it calms down um, just to the, the fairly friendly black hole we have in our neighborhood today. Excellent. Okay, I'm just gonna take one more question and, and this one was directed at both of us, but I'll let you give a stab first. The question is, uh, where can we go to learn more about cosmology or astrophysics? Is there a place where we can uh, take any classes or other opportunities uh, to learn more? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, depending on how much you want to know, there are all manner of, um, of outlets of information um, in the Bay Area and further beyond. Um, so I'm going to start by plugging our own website. Um, we have got lots of um, 
information about our research and some more of the, the background and context of that on our website at kaipac.stanford.edu. Um, I also really recommend, um, if you're just sort of getting started in astronomy, you don't, um, you don't really know where to start. Actually, the, there's a lot of amateur astronomical societies around. Um, there's several in the Bay Area. There's one in San Francisco. There's one in San Jose. Um, there's one in San Mateo. Um, and these astronomical societies have whole programs of events for the public. They invite speakers in to talk about different topics at an accessible level, and they host star parties, stargazing evenings, um, all sorts. Um, but then um, if you want to sort of look into things more seriously, um, there are classes available through um, colleges, community colleges, um, through some of the online colleges as well. Um, yeah, there, there really is a lot. Fantastic. Well, that, that was a great answer. And I, I, I will just add uh, to what Dan said that there are lots of opportunities uh, to learn, uh, including, uh, you know, some classes that we teach at Stanford. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with one more uh, interesting science question, and then we'll wrap up. So the last question is, um, since, since dark matter only responds to gravity, does it follow that black holes have a greater density of dark matter than they do normal matter or baryonic matter? Um, so that's actually an interesting question. So on the face of it, um, yes, a, a dark matter should feel the force of gravity, which means it will be pulled into a black hole in exactly the same way as everything else. But actually, the fact that black hole, that dark matter only feels the force of gravity actually saves it a little bit from black holes because the, um, the normal matter that, that we're made of um, emits light. It can get hot and then it can cool down by emitting light. Um, and then when material cools down, it can collapse and that's what lets it fall into a black hole. Dark matter, on the other hand, if it starts hot, if it starts moving quickly, it doesn't have these opportunities to cool down which means that the dark matter has this, this sort of pressure, if you like, from its, its, its thermal energy, from its motion that keeps it up. It stops it being pulled together. So it can actually save it from being held, it can actually being pulled into the black hole. Yeah, fantastic. And that relates back to actually what we heard about last uh, two weeks ago with uh, dark matter and the tiny galaxies that live within them. Okay, well, um, we're gonna end there. Um, let's uh, virtually thank Dan. Um, let me also thank Dan for really being the instigator and organizer of this uh, series, which we're really lucky to, uh, to have his expertise in helping us uh, keep this thing going and, and get it organized and engaging all of you. So we're gonna have our next lecture in, uh, in two more weeks. Um, Dr. Jessie Muir, um, who is a Parat Fellow at KIPAC, She's gonna be talking about echoes of the early universe. So how the oldest observable light, uh, the cosmic microwave background can teach us about fundamental physics, things like the nature of uh, dark energy and how the, why the universe is expanding like it is. So we're really in for a treat uh, with that lecture in two weeks and, and we'll be continuing uh, roughly bi-weekly after that. So please um, stay tuned, sign up for our mailing list and I hope, uh, I hope we'll see you again uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, thanks again, Dan, for, uh, for joining. And thanks to, to our entire audience on Zoom and YouTube um, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Reza. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.